The thing I remember from that night, as much as I remember Frank Haynes' blood-soaked bed, as much as I remember what was left of his gelatinous head after the crowbar had done its work, as much as I remember how he had been bound and gagged with his own silk neckties, as much as I remember the instant nausea that those sights can induce in the teenage boy who discovers them, was the way my foot shook on the gas pedal after I cranked up my old comet and headed straight to Carl's. It was as if the shock and fright of finding Frank had puddled in a frenzy down around my right ankle. And yet that car, red leather interior, no power steering, a radio that longed for FM, did not jerk and sputter as I turned onto the interstate. It seemed instead to head more smoothly onward with each spastic brush of my scuffed basswegian against the gas pedal. That's the core of the memory, of all my memories really, the eerie smoothness of the ride. When I am asked why Southern writers particularly have a penchant for writing about freaks, I say it's because we're still able to recognize one, said Flannery O'Connor. The first time I read that remark, I laughed at O'Connor's knowing wit and divine slyness. And yet, as in her stories, when such wit, such slyness can curdle together into a kind of wisdom that sits like clabber atop the churned up innocence of our lives, it also left a sour, long ago taste in my mouth. It tightened my throat. The first freak I ever recognized down south where I was born half a century ago now was my own reflection in a Mississippi mirror. I was confronted with a glass of such clabber served ice cold with day-old cornbread crumbled into it on the day of my mother's funeral, November 19, 1964, when my brother and sister and I officially moved in with our maternal grandparents who lived in the country a few miles outside a little town called Forest. Our father, a sports celebrity of local renown, had only recently been killed in an automobile accident. His death, he flew from his beloved baby blue Volkswagen after running a stop sign at a country intersection and colliding with a car with Neshoba County plates, made headlines across the state. One year later, our mother was now dead of esophageal cancer. Dying so soon after my father, my mother enabled me to utilize what little sorrow I was feeling for him. Her dying deepened it allowed it to seep forever into my life, like the blood that ran from his flat-topped head when it hit that newly paved country road. Red, thick yolks of the stuff oozed past his butch-waxed thatch of bristles and blackened even more the fresh asphalt, drawing the flies that buzzed over a neighboring pasture where they swarmed around cattle that looked up, for a second, at the sound of the crash and then turned away to focus on their cuds. Different sorts of headlines followed the death of my mother, my siblings and I being the subject of human interest features located next to a bunch of ladies club columns and weekly county newspapers nestled among the stories about high school football, pork futures, and firebombed churches. The Sesums Orphans became our handle as we were paraded around the state and asked to do some fancy dribbling at the halftime of charity basketball games set up for our college funds and little country gymnasiums. Such places became secular sanctuaries to me. The sweet syncopation of balls bouncing against hardwood during a shoot-around was as competitive, as alluring as that Rich vs. Roach album of battling drummers I listened to once I grew up and let my love of Ella Fitzgerald lead me to other LPs. Gymnasium. It was the first big word I ever learned. It made masculinity musical to my little ears. I went around saying it softly to myself over and over, proud that I was able to pronounce it, loving how pretty it sounded in my mouth. Gymnasium. A man's name was in there. C was in there, too. The very sound of mmm I knew to say when I really liked something, when it tasted good, when I wanted to taste it again. A gymnasium was also the place where my stern father felt secure enough to show me some tenderness. He had been an all-American basketball player at the state Southern Baptist Institute of Higher Learning, Mississippi College. Drafted by the New York Knicks in 1956 after my mother had just given birth to me, he had returned home from Manhattan at her behest. A Southern belle through and through, she could not see herself managing to survive in the vertical hustle and bustle of a northern urban high-rise with a squalling newborn to care for. She told my father he had a choice. Either he could play for the Knicks and live alone or come home to her and his child and make a more horizontal life in Mississippi, where there were lawns, honey, 
and languor was an assiduously honed attribute.